Hello everyone, I hope you're all well. I'm recording this as I am fasting today on the 17th of Tammuz, that's Thursday. And we'll begin to mark the period of mourning known as the three weeks, when we will remember the destruction of both temples and all the great calamities that have fallen upon us in the last 2,000 years such as pogroms and holocausts and terrible things, all of which are a direct result of us being a people in exile. I was talking to somebody last week who told me that when they were newly married, they went on honeymoon to America and they found out they were going to be in a certain place over Rosh Hashanah and they looked up the local Orthodox synagogue and they realized it was about a two mile walk from their hotel. And they learned the way and they made their way there in very, very hot weather. And when they were told they couldn't come in, when they got there, they were told they couldn't come in because in America, the shuls raise money by selling tickets. And without a ticket, they were not allowed to come in, and even though he said to come back after Yom Tov and pay, they nevertheless told them no ticket, no entry. So they made their way back to their hotel. This uh, man told me his newlywed wife, walking 40 minutes each way in Hatton Heels in the boiling heat, was not very impressed with his plans. And when they got to the hotel, they saw lots of Jewish people coming in. And they asked what's going on. They were told that a local Sephardi shul, I think Iranian shul, was too small for the members over on Rosh Hashanah. So they took the ballroom of that hotel for their services on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. So they joined in with them, with them and they wouldn't let them pay. And they had lots of wonderful invitations back for lunch. And that was the story of their first Rosh Hashanah. And I tell you this because, please God, next week we'll be opening the shul for Monday and Thursday, but you will need a ticket. The tickets are free, but they need to be booked from the shul website. And it's uh, very exciting, even though it's going to be different and somewhat difficult uh, to run services in a socially distanced way. We have made very, very, very... Um, rigorous processes to ensure that everybody who comes will please God be as safe as they can possibly be and I look forward to seeing those who are fit and able and not isolating and not worried about their health in particular to come and see us next week Monday and Thursdays at 8 o'clock in the morning. In this week's Sedra we find a handover we find that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu appoints Joshua to take over the leadership because he knew that he was not going to be given the opportunity to lead the people into the land of Israel. And we're told, the Talmud tells us that when the Jewish people saw that Joshua was going to be leading them, they said, Oilonu. Woe to us for this humiliation and shame. They didn't seem too happy that Joshua was going to be leading them instead of the great Moses. And the question is, it's not a seemingly nice thing for them to say. What had Joshua done wrong? And the Chafetz Chaim explains that he gives a, he gives a parable, of a, a marshal, a story of a wealthy businessman who sees huge potential, untapped potential in the little villages where he lived, where people were very primitive and uh, it was very undeveloped. And he wanted to develop, he wanted to build, he wanted to bring today, it would be bringing technology, developing systems. And he realized he needed somebody local to implement uh, what he wanted to do. So he went around the village and he made announcements. He's looking for somebody to manage his projects. He said he'll provide the money and the person who joins him will 
get a percentage of the venture. And people were skeptical, no one quite trusted, no one quite believed. Except one person said he had nothing to lose. And he was the one who said, I'll join you. And he became his business partner. And slowly but surely they developed the industry of the area they built. And after a while, this person became, this villager became a very exceptionally wealthy and influential person. And one day they made it back together, the original entrepreneur, together with the villager who is now his partner. They made it back to the village and they came in their big gold carriage. And the villagers looked and they, they said, oh, that could have been us. They realized the villager was the same as them, but he had taken the opportunities that they had ignored. And the Chavaz Chaim explains in the same way. The Jewish people were never jealous of Moshe Rabbeinu. Moses had come as already a great man. He was, come, he was appointed by Hashem to take them out. He was a son of, of a grandson of Levi, the tribe of Levi. So they knew that he came from special stock. He, he was given spirituality. He was the one who's going to bring us the Torah. He's the one going to spend 40 days up, in, up with Hashem on Sinai. So when they saw Moses as a leader, it never bothered them. But Joshua was never more special than anyone else. He wasn't blessed with a better family. He wasn't naturally cleverer. He just took his opportunity. We're told he was the one who would stay behind. The last one out the base of Medjush and would put away the Svarim. He was the one who put day and night into becoming, into making himself worthy of leading the Jewish people. And when the Jewish people saw him, it wasn't having a go at Joshua. They didn't say woe to us because Joshua is going to lead us. It wasn't about Joshua. They were looking at themselves and they were saying, imagine if we taken those opportunities where we could be today. And that's always a lesson for all of us. Because in life, we always have opportunities. But we decide whether we take them, whether we're going to grow, whether we're going to use this, ignore these next three weeks or whether we're going to grow and become close to Hashem and realize how much we need a temple because a temple would mean a world of peace, a world with no violence, a world with no wars, and a world with no illness. All these things which for us are so difficult to, to, to come to terms with because we're so used to them. But so many people in the world are crying out for salvation, for harmony, for peace. And this is what we mean when we daven, when we pray, that we want Hashem to return us to our land, to be a people of, of to reach out, to be a people of our, to, to see our destiny fulfilled in the coming, please God, of the third temple speedily in our days. Good Shabbos.